stuff. Okay. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon and evening to all of you who have uh, joined us today. I would like to firstly wish every woman in this room from every walk of life a very happy International Women's Day. Um, we, we are that equal uh, percent in the population that have been contributing to the economy in various and very diverse ways from working to providing food to giving life to little human beings to looking after that little human being, teaching them, training them all to be future leaders of tomorrow and contributors to the economy. We have the ability to shape tomorrow vis-a-vis -vis the men in the population as well. I am very pleased to welcome you to this event, Stepping Up Women's Economic Empowerment Through Voluntary Sustainability Standards, which is organized by the United Nations Forum on Sustainability Standards, in short, the UNFSS, and it has been co-organized with the International Gender Champions. The UNFSS is an initiative of six United Nations agencies, the FAO, ITC, UNEC, UNIDO, UNEP, and also UNCTAD, uh, which is mainly coordinated by the Secretariat in UNCTAD. We will leave you uh, the website link in the chat box. The UNFSS was formed to mediate this situation where mainstreaming voluntary sustainability standards, despite it being a powerful tool to promote the alignment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals in international trade and global value chains. It may also uh, result in effects such as barriers to trade, for example, especially for producers in developing countries. So um, when we say barriers to trade, we are not specifically referring to tariffs, but rather social costs that may put some uh, smallholder producers who do not always have the capacity to operate using modern sustainable tools and which may often leave them out of the market. So the framework in the UNFSS typically falls under three key priorities. They are to provide adequate uh, information about VSS to the public through research, to, pro to promote cooperation between stakeholders and between countries through policy dialogue, to support and strengthen uh, national platforms through capacity building. With that, I am very honored to be moderating this session with renowned experts and practitioners that we have with us here today. But before that, let me hand over the floor to our UNFSS coordinator and UNCTAD economist, Mr. Santiago Fernandez de Cordoba, who will officially open this webinar. Santiago, over to you. Thank you, Ruby, for uh, opening the webinar and uh, for the kind introduction. Um, in this International Women's Day, of course, we have to celebrate the day, but our first thoughts go to all those women suffering today the consequences of armed co conflict around the world. But Allow me to start by setting the scene uh, for uh, the dialogue through some examples. Imagine working the same amount of time with equal qualifications and earning 85% less than your coworkers. This is what our research shows for women employed in low income countries, agricultural sector. Or imagine that despite more women working than men in the agricultural sector, only an estimated 13% of women own agricultural land in low income countries. Or imagine only 29% of women compared to 40% of men have an account at a financial institution. Or imagine that 80% of women in sub-Saharan Africa and 73% in South Southern Africa are found to have uh, what is defined as a vulnerable employment. These are some examples of what our research shows of the situation of women working in the agriculture sector in developing countries around the world. Now, we are all, uh, all aware that while international trade has contributed has created better jobs for women, provided them with opportunities for welfare benefits, training and job security, there still persists widely systematic gender inequalities, such as food insecurity, unequal access to land, productive resources and education, gender division of unpaid care and domestic work, lack of access to decision-making and empowerment, 
and precarious conditions of agricultural work, all of which are barriers to women equality and undermine their condition to economic, environmental, and social sustainability. But what is the link between voluntary sustainability standards and women economic empowerment? Voluntary sustainability standards, or VSS as they are known, are requirements re related to a wide range of sustainability makers, including respect for human basic human rights, workers' health and security, and environmental impacts, which must be met to gain certification to prove sustainability of a product. Today, many actors look at VSS as one of the market-based policy instruments to accelerate the achievement of women economic empowerment. The research that we will present today focuses on the agricultural sector and brings, brings forth that VSS can advance women economic empowerment directly and indirectly. Directly through the impact on employment conditions and providing a higher and more stable income stream. And indirectly through enabling better living conditions such as extended uh, conditions for access to education, land rights, and increased voice in the decision-making process. Furthermore, today we aim to grasp the effects of women economic empowerment through knowledge exchange and best practices on the ground on three key touch points. VSS to facilitate better women employment conditions and training, VSS to facilitate women access to, to credit for financial and agricultural inputs, VSS to facilitate women's decision-making power. It is important to mention that VSS is one tool among others and its implementation is not free of challenges for developing countries. Hence, the role of VSS in fostering women economic empowered demands profound research. My colleague, Nima El Amin, will present our report on the link between VSS and their contribution to the global agenda of SDGs 5, gender equality. She will also present some empirical findings on the impact of VSS on women economic empowerment and provide some recommendations on the, on the topic. To conclude, for us, uh, gender parity and women economic empowerment are key considerations for the work that we undertake. undertake. In fact, this is the second consecutive year in which we are hosting this dialogue. I would like to thank our co-organizers, the International Gender Champions, and all the distinguished panelists who have taken the time to join us today. I look forward to today's dialogue. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you very much, Santiago. You have very nicely set the scene for this webinar. Indeed, it is our second year hosting an event specifically targeted to women. And uh, what we, we want to aim is to gain new learnings each year. Well, last year we discussed in general uh, what BSS mean for women and how women have a role in BSS. We have indeed carried this dialogue forward this year by conducting a research specifically on this topic. So without further ado, uh, let me hand the floor over to my colleague, Nima Tala Elamin, economics in Ongtad, to present some of the key findings and recommendations of our research on exploring the role of voluntary sustainability standards for women's economic empowerment on the agriculture sector in developing countries. Quite mouthful, but Nima, over to you. Thank you, Ruby. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I will be presenting our upcoming research that uh, investigates the link between VSS and women's economic empowerment. Before I do that, uh, we wanted to collect your views and to know more about uh, how do you view the link between uh, VSS and women's economic empowerment. We have prepared a quick poll question to get to know how you uh, tend to think on the link between VSS and women's economic empowerment. Uh, please do poll. Yes. So uh, our question is, do you think that VSS can aid in women's economic empowerment? We have three options, either yes, no, or not sure. You have around 15 seconds to answer. Thank you. Wow, most of the uh, participants 
83% of the participants think that VSS do have uh, or can aid in women's economic empowerment. I'll be presenting our research finding and we will know more about whether VSS can impact women's economic empowerment and how do they impact them. Allow me first to share my screen. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nima El Amin. I work as an associate economist at UNCTAD and today I will be presenting on exploring the role of voluntary sustainability standards or VSS for women's economic empowerment in the agriculture sector in developing countries. This upcoming research is co-authored by Santiago Fernandez de Cordoba, Ruby Lambert, Rupal Verma and myself from UNCTAD. The aims and objectives of the research and the study is to study the link between VSS and women's economic empowerment in the agriculture sector in developing countries. And based on that, to identify the strengths and weaknesses of VSS in, promote, in promoting women's economic empowerment, and also to provide some recommendations for relevant actors that can facilitate the role of VSS in fostering women's economic empowerment. The first question that could come in mind is why the agriculture sector? Our study focuses on the agriculture sector because as we know, this sector is an important and significant sector to the economy of developing countries, low-income countries, and least developed countries. It contributes to a big percentage or a big share of the GDP of these countries. In addition, the female employment in the agriculture sector in low-income countries is big and big percentage of women in these countries are mostly employed in agriculture. If we look to the figure to the left, we see that in low income countries, more than 60% of women work in the agriculture sector in comparison to services and industries. And this is also the case in specific or in some regions around the world, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where more than half of women in these regions work in the agriculture sector. Although this is the case and more women are working in, in low income countries in the agriculture sector, however, uh, the data that we had, the data that we found available showed us that in most of these countries, women are less paid than men in this sector, as also uh, what was shown by Santiago in his opening remarks. Because of that, we thought of investigating and looking at the uh, possibility of VSS in contributing to women's economic empowerment. And by women's economic empowerment, we mean three main pillars that we decided based on the literature and also previous experiences, experiences in, the, uh, in this topic. So the three pillars of women economic empowerment that we looked at are the opportunities as well as access and control over resources and increased voice agency and meaningful participation in the decision making. By opportunities, we mean uh, education, employment, women's ability to participate equally in existing markets. And with regard to access and control over resources, we mean financial services, land rights, and also access to productive resources ownership, as well as cash income, as well as uh, the um, increased voice and agency and participation of women in the decision making process. So first, to know the status of um, all, all these pillars or the uh, women's economic empowerment in low-income countries, we looked at data from different sources, including the UN, ILO, FAO, and the World Bank. And all the data that we got regarding the three pillars of women's economic empowerment showed that women have less opportunities in comparison to men and also less access and control over resources and less voice and uh, level of participation in the decision making. And some of the data was also mentioned by uh, Santiago in his opening remarks. So based on that and based on the... Uh, role of VSS and the requirement of VSS, we uh, developed uh, a theoretical um, model uh, that shows how VSS could potentially impact women's economic empowerment. From the literature, we observed that VSS could directly and indirectly impact women's economic empowerment directly through um, affecting or improving the employment conditions also the financial support and the income stream for women. Because VSS, most of the F of VSS do include non-discriminatory employment practices in the requirement. And also most of the VSS include a separate gender non-discriminatory policy. Uh, this improves the employment condition for women. And uh, in addition to that, um, 
with regard to financial support, many VSS um, include that workers should have right to live in wage irrespective of the gender. And also VSS provides financial premium, which is price premium to those who are uh, complying uh, with, with the VSS. Uh, and this means that through the financial support and through the better employment condition, uh, women could have a better income stream and this leads to empowering women. Also, VSS could impact women indirectly and the indirect impact could be through the policies that VSS have uh, in their requirement that could promote education, training, and could prevent also child labor. And this helps in enabling better living conditions such as extended conditions for access to education, land rights, increased voice in the decision making process. So theoretically, VSS could impact women directly and indirectly. In order to investigate that, we looked at uh, three main points. First, the design of VSS, and then the evidence that is available on the impact of VSS on women's economic empowerment on ground. And based on that, we analyze the strengths and challenges of VSS. First, looking at the design of VSS, VSS are generally not designed with a focus on women or gender equality. And only 30% of VSS is in the ITC standard map cover gender issue. Also, the way that the gender issues are covered are different in terms of how they are integrated in the standards document and also how they are translated into practice. A study by ITC, UNCTAD, EUI, DIE, and University of Amsterdam that looked at the link between the VSS included in the standards map uh, ITC standards map requirement and the 17 SDGs revealed that with regard to SDG 5, which is, start, which is gender equality, VSS requirements do have the potential to impact women's economic empowerment. As can be seen from the, from the figure, um, most of uh, the, uh, the uh, targets that have most linkages with VSS requirement are target two, which is violence against women, target five, which is women's leadership, and target one, which is gender discrimination. And also there is uh, a few um, amount of, um, of um, requirement that uh, um, could reflect um, or could aid to target four, which is care work. This means that from a design perspective, VSS do have the potential to impact women's economic uh, empowerment and also to impact gender equality. However, this is not enough, and we need to look in uh, to look for some evidence and to look in practice whether PSS actually impacts women's economic empowerment. And in order to get more information on that, we collected, uh, we looked, we did a comprehensive analysis of the literature, and we looked at the studies that empirically investigated the impact of VSS on women's economic empowerment and gender equality. And as you can see from the screen, we only found net, the 10 studies that empirically investigated the link and the relationship between VSS and women's economic empowerment. So the studies are few in number, and also the studies focused on very few standards, focused mainly on fair trade and organic, and also all um, with one exception, with only one exception, nine studies out of the 10 studies um, had only one case study or focus on one country, which means that there is, was not um, a cross-sectional analysis across countries and across uh, value chains. So, um, and uh, the studies also are um, different in terms of mapping different geography, mapping different value chains and commodities. So it can be said that given that we, we have a very few number of studies and they focus on few standards and there is none a cross-sectional type of analysis, we cannot uh, get any conclusive idea on what is the impact of uh, VSS on women's economic empowerment. If we look at the uh, column to the right, we see that some of the studies concluded that VSS positively impact gender equality and women's economic empowerment. Other studies concluded that there is no effect and some studies concluded that it has a negative e effect on women's economic empowerment. So the evidence on ground showed that we cannot draw any conclusive results. Based on the design of VSS and based on the analysis of the uh, empirical evidence, then we uh, conducted um, an analysis of what are the strengths and the challenges for VSS to impact women's economic empowerment, given the three um, 
uh, pillars of women's economic empowerment we identified earlier, which is our opportunities represented in employment conditions, financial support, and decision-making power. Uh, starting with employment conditions, as I mentioned, BSS do have some requirements that um, refer to um, not having any discrimination in terms of the em em employment. However, in terms of the challenges, some of the challenges that impact the ability of PSS to promote women economic empowerment first is the need, is the need for data. Because there is gender data gaps and underreporting of women, specifically in the agriculture sector, uh, and uh, this uh, affects um, and, uh, and triggers the need for data on how much change these PSS schemes have brought about for women and also for companies they work for. And also we, we need data to know whether the incentives for companies are sufficiently large to enable the schemes to scale up. Also, there is the issue of that certification may increase the work burden on women because uh, some studies show that um, if there is any additional, because the certification in general requires additional tasks in order to improve the product quality and the environmental management. A number of studies showed that in small boulder and farms, this additional labor is usually provided by women. There is also the issue of lack of time and mobility for women to attend extension services and training, and that extension and technical support are more likely to reach men than women. And finally, there is the issue of missing the point on child labor. Because uh, family farms, culture and tradition is different from one place to other, and it can make it difficult sometimes to distinguish between children's participation in light work activities and child labor. In, in some countries, in some cultures, including the country I come from, which is Sudan, this is not considered, for example, as child labor. However, as kids help in their families in light work, participating with them, and etc. So participating in some farm activities can give the children the opportunity to develop skills and a sense of belonging to the community. But the certification typically prohibits any child labor and does not differentiate between child labor and children participating in light work. And this can prevent women who have young children from performing agriculture work on their fields for uh, on, on their own fields or even for, for wage. With regard to financial support, as mentioned, BSS uh, mentioned that workers should have the right for living wage irrespective of gender, and there is a price premium that could um, um, help and provide additional financial support to women. But in terms of the challenges, there is the issue of lacking financial literacy. In order to gain access to financial resources, this is needed to, uh, women need financial literacy and in low income countries and in countryside, they lack this financial literacy and ma make, make it difficult for certifications also to help in uh, strengthening women and promoting women's economic empowerment and also, um, there is the issue of uh, undermine, undermining food security because women are typically responsible for subsistence agriculture, which contributes to household food security, while men tend to dominate the cash crops. Thus, the unequal gender related uh, land tenors could be further, uh, could affect actually and could make a negative, uh, could have additional negative impact by the certification. And this could result in women losing their access to land for uh, subsistence food production uh, and could make it could make the situation worse for for them. With regard to decision making power, uh, the policies to promote the VSS have policies to promote education, training, and to prevent child labor. But the problem is uh, always the unequal gender power structure. So given the strengths and the weakness, uh, weaknesses of VSS in promoting women's economic empowerment, we provided some uh, recommendations as follows. First, with regard to employment and training, our analysis showed that all, there is a knowledge gap in terms of uh, um, what we, for small holders, farmers, and producers on what are VSSs and what they could do. So there is a need for a knowledge sharing activities from governments, NGOs, as well as standards organization. Uh, include, uh, in addition to, uh, uh, to um, when designing VSS to put in, in, in mind the local context and the situation of target communities, um, especially also when designing training and, tra and designing capacity building activities, uh, specifically the activities that focus on women's economic uh, empowerment. Also in order to increase the share of uh, women participating in training activities, it's good to have female trainers and also to have some training particularly that uh, particularly for women, uh, 
in addition to that, with regard to access to uh, resources, there is a need for financial support that is directed to women and uh, some uh, financing um, models that are affordable for women and uh, in addition to provide access to agriculture resources and uh, to uh, increase the participation, um, sorry, uh, and to increase also the, uh, or work on enhancing the rights uh, for women uh, to have rights for land. Um, with regard to the decision-making power, uh, it's good to include women as partners in designing and implementing voluntary sustainability standards and also for governments, NGOs, to support this establishment of women producers organization because as mentioned, one of the problems is the unbalanced power structure within the value chain, establishing women producer organization enhances the voice of women and their ability to um, be more organized and to uh, be more included in the decision-making um, processes. With regard to data, governance, research, and impact, there is a need for more robust evidence. As what was seen by the literature review that we did, there is no conclusive result on how VSS impact women's economic empowerment. So there is a need for more evidence and this needs data. So there is a need for transparency in terms of the data availability. And finally, with regard to standards design, it is necessary to adapt the standards to the local context in producing countries because this is going to make the standards more accessible to farmers and more uh, also understandable for them if it's linked to their local context. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you for your time and I'm looking forward for the discussion and for the questions from the uh, uh, attendees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nima. That was a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. Um, it's nice that you managed to turn uh, uh, 20, 30 pages of uh, study into, I don't know, five slides. But uh, thank you very much for that. I, I hope that with this presentation, it gives you sort of a better sense what this dialogue is about, um, especially in terms of what are the some of the factors that VSS can help contribute to women's economic empowerment. So to facilitate this concept, I would firstly like to invite Dr. Mercedes Arauz, Professor of International Economics and Public Policy at the Universidad del Pacifico. Uh, she's also the UNFS's Academic Advisory Council co-chair and a former Vice President of Peru. So Mercedes, would you be able to share with us your initial thoughts and directions of this study? Over to you. Thank, thank you, Siri and Nima, for the fantastic presentation. And I want to congratulate the authors of this report because it's quite a complete uh, review of the literature and also an interesting uh, document for policymakers that can help them to think about the issues of VSS related to the gender issues. Uh, and before starting my comments, I really would like to congratulate all the women in the panel and also that are listening to us in this day because we are thinking together on how to improve the livelihood of many women in the world, particularly the more vulnerable. So this is fantastic to have this young adventure with many men also involved in this process. Thank you very much. Well. I think, as I mentioned, that this document, which is around 38 pages, is fantastic. Really help understand the issues that are important in <clears throat> the use of VSS as an instrument for supporting the development of women in, uh, in our countries, in, in developing countries in particular. Uh, it was clearly mentioned that there is lack of, of research, so we have to focus on that. I, what I saw from the review is one of the latest documents that was published was from 2017, more or less. Uh, you, we don't have more reports or work done related to that uh, most recently, particularly after the pandemic, in which we will see that most of women are usually the ones that are bearing the... the 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 weight of of the the pandemia and the extra work at home and 
and also in, 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 <clears throat> in the rural areas in which were the ones who were supporting us in the cities uh, for having our food. So it's very important to see what is going on there. And many people were moving from the vulnerable areas in the cities to the rural areas during the pandemic. And so what happened in rural areas is something we have to study with more uh, research that can help understand what is going on with this work uh, at that, uh, there in, in many of our countries. Another thing that I, is, is interesting is that they collected important uh, aggregated data and statistics, but it's clear with this data, we can see that there are countries in which there are big differences between the income women receive like 85% is amazing, uh, coming from 30% to 85%. But this aggregated data, if we can see it with more detail, it will be more interesting if we can go and see more micro issues. Because it's true, this is happening in the least developed countries, but at the middle income countries, also we can see these big differences in rural areas. Uh, uh, compare, comparing the income that women and men receive and the issues on uh, the right to land ownership and all these issues are there also middle income countries and we can, uh, because not only disaggregated data is there, we can probably dismiss the possibility that in middle income countries uh, which are in that trap probably uh, don't see that they have in this problem also. So we have to focus on that. Uh, another issue that I think is very important is that GSS can really create value, but usually are connected with the, those uh, enterprises and firms that are more in the formal, what we call the formal sector, uh, or many family businesses are not connected to these value chains. And probably where this, we don't see the real problem that is going on there. There's an opportunity as was mentioned that creating cooperatives or other association of producers of these small family businesses, made, I hope run by women, will be an interesting way to introduce VSS to their lives and improve the possibilities of having a better income. Because sometimes what we see is that they are not connected to this part of the market. And unfortunately, most of the issues that we're seeing of uh, child employment or problems of less uh, human rights really protected are usually in these areas are unconnected with this DSS, which are ma market instruments that we are seeing in the market. Uh, and that's interesting. Uh, the focus of, of the study is also a very good process because you see how the benefits can come from BSS directly and indirectly through uh, the, these three major issues, which are salaries and, and income, as I mentioned, uh, the, the employment and training, uh, access to resources as, uh, like land and financial support. And of course, the ability to have the women making the being part of decision making in the process of uh, having the ownership of uh, VSS. So I think that the, the, the analysis is quite strong and can bring us some interesting uh, proposals as was the, that were mentioned right before. And these proposals are, there are several that I think are interesting and are worth mentioning, you know, all the issues of employment and, and the related income and working conditions that women should have, living wages, the benefits of the price premium. Sometimes these benefits don't go directly to the workers, but we have to make sure of that. For, for example, in the community in the, uh, that they are working, for example, maybe the, these price premiums may help them to develop issues like water supply for themselves, uh, water and sewage, or having schools, or having um, child care. One of the documents that proved that the child care is not uh, taking care that much. And so probably child care for women in, in those communities may help. That's direct benefit for them. Access to resources. 
I, right of, uh, to the line is very important. And then financial support. Most of the interesting uh, programs of microcredit that I see in the world are those related with uh, solidarity credits. Uh, and it's interesting because this program started in Asia and now they are in Latin America. We see them in Mexico, in Peru, in Guatemala. And they are very small uh, a, a group of women together generating resources together and paying all together and making the, the guarantees themselves. So these programs of solidarity credits can be used to improve the access to credit to many women that are not totally in the formal sector, but in the formal sector. And they can start bringing up their own entrepreneurship there to that. So solidarity credit should be an interesting program that should focus. Promoting the cooperatives and other producer associations, women producer association is very important also. And making sure that in the governments of VSS, we see more women because it's true. Uh, is, things are not seen if the, our voice is not there. <laughs> so probably we are preparing VSS without listening what are the needs of women in this process. So another point I would like to make is, well, we have to keep going on the research and data creation, and we need the governments involved. We need governments to learn about VSS. What I'm seeing is that there's not that much interest coming from the governments in our side. I mean, they, they see it as, as a private issue and they don't see that this part of a process of improving the quality of living, improving the, the fight for the, the, the effects of, of, of climate change, improving the, the, the livelihood of, of people that are most vulnerable in, in, in the rural area. So I see this is something that we have to make a voice listen in in governments uh, and well it's very good that you and uh, FSC is doing it right now, right now so thank you very much for this report i think now we're gonna see in the practical way with the panelists how each country can manage these issues thank you very much Thank you very much, Mrs. Excellent review. Um, we truly appreciate your remarks and would now like to extend this dialogue with our expert speakers. Our speakers today represent different spectrum in the economy and different parts of the world. Um, the first speaker, allow me to introduce uh, His Excellency Chad Blackman, uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Barbados to the United Nations, who is also the global board of the International Gender Champions Leadership Network and also the chairperson of the um, Geneva chapter of the Group 77, which, you know, I feel like it's a rather important group of developing countries that, that provides the means for the, the countries of the South to articulate and promote their collective economic interests, especially in the interest to promote South-South cooperation for development. With so many of these titles and important attributes to the global economy, how do you see the role of VSS contributing to women's economic empowerment? Ambassador, over to you. Thank you very much. And first, let me start by saying uh, to all women here and around the world, happy International Women's Day, uh, particularly given what's happening in the world, we need to even more redoubling uh, our efforts in ensuring that women uh, can continue to thrive in an environment that's predictable uh, and allows them to prosper and to grow. Uh, and it's certainly an honor and a privilege to be taking part in this event today and to serve on the panel of such an impressive cadre of empowered women uh, from around the world. Now, notwithstanding this, I believe that today's event is key to realizing how much more work needs to be done, uh, particularly in terms of stepping up women's economic empowerment. I agree with the premise in the report that um, VSS can be a potential tool to achieving many of the gender related SDGs and therefore in enhancing women's economic empowerment. I will, however, seek to focus my response on three areas. Firstly, gender data gaps and under reporting of women's agricultural activities. Secondly, focusing on the access to export markets and looking beyond the costs of associated uh, with the VSS. And thirdly, the need for technical assistance and capacity building. Now, one of the issues that has created a major challenge is that for many developing countries, including Caribbean small island developing states, is that there is a dearth of gender disaggregated data for many sectors. 
This has therefore created challenges in terms of presenting precise facts and figures relative to trade and women's economic empowerment and the correlation between this and the issue of standards. Additionally, and importantly, given that some aspects of the agricultural sector may fall within the informal economy of some countries, not all persons employed, including women, may be included in the statistics, thereby contributing to the difficulty in analyzing the scale at which women may be participating in the sector, or the extent to which women's economic empowerment has been affected or enhanced. Caribbean SIDs are characterized in Terralia by their narrow production base, insularity or distance from their main export markets, inability to take advantage of economies of scale and high costs, including that of labor, capital and transportation, which renders their products uncompetitive. The additional costs associated with the VSS studies in particular had in the past been viewed as a barrier to accessing export markets as an additional cost, one of which in many small producers, for example, many of them uh, micro farmers could ill afford. I would like to give two examples of how uh, voluntary standards has been utilized in the Caribbean region, both of which feature industries where women play a critical role. Firstly, as it relates to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and bananas, and secondly, as it relates to Belize and shrimp. The banana industry is one of which uh, has been uh, adopted reasonably well to private standards, with many farmers being certified under fair trade standards. The issue of private standards has been a staple in the WTO's Committee on Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures since St. Vincent and the Grenadines raised specific trade concerns relative to the Europe gap or the global gap as it's now referred, and the equipment for bananas bound for sale to the UK. Now at this time, the small island developing state, uh, St. Vincent in particular, was unable to obtain certification as a result of the cost involved. This therefore meant that the country was no longer able to access the European retail market. Now, despite these initial challenges, the, the country's banana industry has since grown to adopt the fair trade certification and the country's banana sector is now highly experienced in certification requirements of private standards. This was in large part of, out of necessity if the country was to continue exporting to its main market in the EU. The banana sector is one that is very labor intensive and therefore in many jurisdictions, it is primarily dominated by men. Now in St. Vincent, however, women play an important role in terms of those employed and participate in the banana industry. Standards have allowed for the improvement of employment conditions, particularly when these may have been absent at the national level. In the Caribbean region, Fair trade has focused on farmers and workers in an effort to improve livelihoods, investing in property production, sorry, <clears throat> property production, uh, and initiating change through consumer awareness. Fair trade requires that uh, there be an absence of discrimination or a tolerance for discrimination on the basis of a number of elements, including that, of course, of gender. Still sticking with St. Vincent, those who continue in the banana industry do so. Uh, through the international fair trade marketing system, and also by observing the practices and principles established and regulated by the fair trade labeling uh, organizations. Farmers who sell bananas under the fair trade label receive higher prices than those who sell under a traditional system. And in addition, and importantly, fair trade farmers receive a social premium, which is allowed to uh, and also allocated to social and economic development in the fair trading producing communities. Fair trade has led to the improvement uh, of representation of women in worker organizations in that country. Moving then across to uh, Belize, uh, it's a successful example of the implementing of the Aquaculture Stewardship Council certification in a sector that is largely dominated by women in rural areas. Belize was the first developing country to achieve the ASC certification. Now at one point, 90% of the country's shrimp farms uh, output was fully certified. The country's ASC certification is a guarantee that the shrimps were produced with minimal impact on the environment and communities where farms are located and therefore gives the country a competitive advantage in this area. The certification also encourages improvements in coastal zone and fisheries management, addresses issues related to biodiversity, and also guarantees that there are reductions in negative uh, environmental effects through the use of wetland and mangrove preservation and enhancement water 
management and use of feed. Now, the ASC program is aimed at transforming the seafood market and promoting the best environmental and social performance in agriculture. Now, in light of the costs and other regulatory challenges which must be fulfilled in meeting the requirements for VSS, it is very, very clear that governments and other private regulatory bodies, including standard setting bodies themselves and the industry associations, will need, and I really emphasize, will need to play a critical role uh, in building capacity of local firms to meet and also maintain um, voluntary sustainability standards, as well as to develop national standards. Now, an important feature of technical assistance and capacity building will also need to be on training, which will be critical given the conditions of certification will need to be upheld and also can be withdrawn by the certification bodies if the standards are not maintained over time. This is particularly important uh, to bear in mind. Now, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the prerequisite for the attainment of the certification was the establishment of a National Fair Trade Committee. Now, that committee, amongst other things, manages all fair trade related matters. The Windward Islands Farmers Association plays a supporting role in assisting in the training of producers, also assisting with the monitoring and implementation, implementation sorry, criteria for the production of bananas, amongst other roles. In Belize, the Ministry of Agriculture has undertaken a voluntary training program in uh, Global Gap to farmers and processors aimed at modernizing their production techniques and to help improve product safety and quality. Uh, and Chair, I will conclude by recognizing that for small and developing states, the issue of voluntary sustainability standards is one that not only best, is best suited for the agricultural sector, but also the tourism sector, particularly in light of the large number of women working in the sector, as well as given the need to reinvent tourism sectors, which have been battered by the ongoing pandemic uh, and being on the front line of the climate crisis, which affects most, if not all, of our small and developing states. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Blackman. These are very excellent uh, examples you have shared from the seeds, uh, from the seeds, uh, very important for us and also very precise. Um, so, so I would just like to keep on the, 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 the conversation still on international trade and agriculture. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Amrita Bahri, Associate Professor of uh, the International Trade Law at uh, Aitam University, our gender and trade expert actually, who is also the co-chair for Mexico in the uh, WTO chair program. So uh, Amrita, in reference to your work, what are some of the gender related provisions that are already included in free trade agreements and how do you see VSS complementing these provisions? Amrita, over to you. Thank you, Ruby, and uh, thank you for having me at the panel. It's an honor uh, to, to be here. Happy Women's Day to everyone. Um, so let me uh, try and cover, uh, let me try and focus on three different points here. Uh, I'll first argue and explain that trade agreements can empower women. Um, I'll then share some best practice examples that reflect the various ways in which trade agreements can help. And finally, um, I'll, I'll try and share some reflections on whether VSS provisions and trade agreements can work or not. Um, um, so, so trade agreements can empower women. Why? Well, they can be used for two different reasons, diplomatic and substantive. The first reason is diplomatic because trade agreements can be used to reduce gender inequality um, as countries can use these negotiating instruments to incentivize changes at the domestic level. Uh, so in other words, the lure of market access to important markets can be used to enhance gender equality through trade agreements. And of course, the second reason is more substantive because gender equality has now become a business case. Um, as various studies have shown how world economy will only get richer if gender parity is achieved in the next few years. So it is very interesting to see, um, especially in the last few years, that more and more countries now are seeking to empower women through their trade agreements in the trade policy context. And that brings me to my second point on best practice examples. As we speak of all trade agreements in force today, about 20% have an explicit commitment relating to gender equality. 
at least one explicit commitment. And we can expect many more trade agreements, future trade agreements to accommodate these concerns as, as, as gender mainstreaming has gained a lot of traction in the past few years. Different countries have added provisions on gender in various ways. They have assumed commitments on increasing women's access to markets, access to finance, access to land, crops, fertilizers, and other resources, e-commerce and technology opportunities and representation and decision-making roles. Um, and they have stretched all the way to the elimination of employment discrimination and protection of lives of women in conflict and, and, and violence. So this is all very good. And we have a range of gender explicit provisions in today's trade policies and trade agreements. So we can clearly see that many milestones have already been achieved in this respect. Yet a lot remains to be done. And there clearly are problems with the ways in which gender provisions are currently being um, incorporated and negotiated for, for the trade agreements so far. One such problem is that most of these provisions are drafted as best endeavor promises and they're completely unenforceable, right? The other problem is that most trade agreements treat women as social actors, mothers, or employees, and not as business leaders, scientists, or politicians. As they focus on education and training, women's empowerment, women's employment, labor standards, physical safety, maternity needs, child care, and so on and so forth, right? Another fundamental problem with most of the current agreements is the lack of focus on sustainability standards. And this brings me to my third and final point. One effective way to include gender equality discussion within the trade policy discourse is to incorporate in trade agreements provisions on DSS. Through these provisions, countries can encourage or even require an m &E operating within their jurisdiction or subject to their jurisdiction to include gender equality concerns within its code of conduct or in its contract for sales of goods and services. As the study has shown, these standards can promote both internal compliance, so compliance uh, with the company with respect to owners and employees, and external compliance with respect to their suppliers, sub-suppliers, and consumers. Now, one thing is beyond clear. To pursue the achievement of gender equality through trade policies, it is important to take the business stakeholders along on this journey as, the, as they are the victims and they are the beneficiaries of trade policy. And while most standards are not designed to promote gender equality, there are an increasing number of women-focused CSR and uh, VSS provisions that are being developed within the trade policy space for private stakeholders. More recently, Countries have used their trade agreements to encourage their private businesses, private stakeholders to include non-economic sustainability standards in their business plans and procedures. In the Canada-Israel trade agreement, for instance, the parties have sought to encourage their businesses to address issues, CSR issues, including labor, environment, and gender equality. In USMCA, we see Canada, Mexico, and US joining hands and encouraging their enterprises to voluntarily incorporate their internal policies uh, in their internal policies, the internationally recognized standards of corporate social responsibility, such as the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which are gender explicit indeed. So there are these two important developments we have seen more recently. However, there are still not much examples to cite in this respect when we only look at the trade agreements today. Yet these provisions remain fundamental as, business, as businesses and business players are crucial for foreign trade. Businesses gain access um, or enhanced market access, access through trade agreements. So they are indeed the right stakeholders to give back. But there's one fundamental problem I see in applying such provisions and such standards in, in, in trade agreements. The problem is that the benefits of such provisions 
may only directly ex extend to, to workforce in the formal employment sectors. So it may not reach the majority of women workforce as they're employed in informal sectors, mainly in developing countries. Now, recent studies show that 2 billion people in the world work in informal sectors, majority being in emerging and developing countries. Out of these 2 billion workers in the informal sector worldwide, over 740 million are women. Women in the sector frequently work without decent salaries, protection from labor laws, insurance or health cover, maternity benefits, or paid sick leave. So they are the ones that need most protection. And yet, encouraging sustainability standards in business conduct may only reach the ones um, that are employed in the formal sector and already are benefited from these benefits. So the inclusion of standards and trade agreements is vital to engage private stakeholders, yet countries need to consider their use and their application in light of their possible challenge. I'll probably stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Amrita. You're right on time, but you know that was very interesting. I wish we had more time for you as well. Um, it's nice that you especially highlighted how trade agreements can empower women. It's it's a tool that is quite important to look at. Um, it's also very interesting how you also start to mention and engage private uh, stakeholders as well. It is in fact uh, right on spot with our next speaker. Um, who will share with us some experiences women face and gain at industry level itself. So we have here um, Kezi Mukiri, who is a, a trade attorney uh, with ex extensive experience in um, uh, supporting trade organizations and associations build capacity development programs uh, aimed at enabling uh, women entrepreneurs build sustainable and especially thriving and uh, help to thrive enterprises in the African markets. Uh, Kezi is the executive director of Ignite Trade Africa. So Kezi, as an industry player, um, how do you think VSS can enable or facilitate both gender equality and sustainable development? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Siti. Um, and uh, my uh, celebration of women uh, as well, uh, around the world on this panel as we celebrate uh, International Women's Day. City, I want to just begin my comments uh, by reiterating some, some of the issues that have been mentioned by uh, previous speakers. Indeed, um, sustainability standards have a critical role to play in both enhancing gender equality, but also uh, providing leadways for women's economic um, uh, enhancement. We've seen previous uh, social protection programs for women. We've seen various initiatives around even countries right here in Africa. But lately, you've seen the move towards trade not aid. We are now looking more towards initiatives that will facilitate economic empowerment for women, that will facilitate um, access to markets that will enable women to trade. I come from the perspective where I believe that if we can enhance um, the economic progress or the economic um, uh, 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 space for women, we will have dealt with a majority of the sustainable development goals. If we can facilitate trade and business, open up opportunities for uh, economic empowerment for women, we'll have dealt with a majority of the issues that are plaguing us, particularly here on the continent. We know that African economies are amongst the most heavily affected uh, by uh, the detrimental effects of climate change, for example. Even though Africa's contribution is negligible, it remains the most vulnerable um, of all um, uh, continents. And, and therefore, mitigation of climate change, um, supporting women in agriculture, looking at um, the contribution of women and like was uh, properly stated, majority of the players in the agricultural sector, for example, are women. We have key economic sectors in Africa, agriculture being one of them, that bear a largely untapped potential. 
and and we look at women that are playing a role in that sector uh, in uh, forestry and agriculture and and the impact that vss may have for them but not just in agriculture we now have more women playing critical roles in tourism in in the services sector just uh, recently with um, the coming to effect of the africa continental free trade agreement we now see priority sectors such as uh, tourism uh, services and this because of uh, low uh, barriers to entry we see more women uh, playing a significant role in in that space so we look at what's, what's the impact and what doorways can be opened up for them in, in that space. Um, critical to note that is that the success of African products in the international markets will begin to decisively depend on meeting the rising consumer demands for sustainability. So when we are doing uh, capacity development programs, we're looking at what, what is the consumer demand and we have more demand uh, by consumers for sustainab uh, sustainably produced uh, goods and services. I saw a recent study um, that, that focused on consumers within Sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the projections was that I believe by 2030, that we'll have about 65% of consumers wanting to purchase uh, sustainably developed uh, uh, products. So, we see there's an opportunity right there for, for women to tap into uh, that market um, and, and to begin to leverage on uh, VSS um, to, to communicate um, what is the impact of their, I mean, the, the environmental credentials of their products. Uh, it will become a, a way of measuring uh, their impact as, as entrepreneurs or measuring um, their contribution towards uh, sustainability. I think uh, critical also to note is that um, the dynamics on our continent, we are the youngest continent with a median age of 19. So we begin to look at what are the buying patterns on the continent? What are consumers demanding? Again, a study reflecting on the buying patterns of Generation Z, the Gen Zers, who are more global, who are more demanding in terms of what they are looking for as they, as they are purchasing. And, and therefore, for, for women, that is an opportunity. A, a great a consideration as well is uh, access to green financing. One of the biggest ch challenges for women entrepreneurs has been the typical three, access to markets, access to information, access to finance and then now we are seeing a trend where there is more funds being allocated for um sustainable businesses more funds that have been allocated just uh, the other day we had one of the biggest banks in kenya uh sending out uh, some figures and i think they were showing that for 2021 they lend about an equivalent of uh, i was 18.8 billion um in kenya shillings to SMEs in form of green financing. Of course, we don't have the numbers. How many of that went to women-owned enterprises because of the data issues that we know we have as a, uh, as a continent? But there is an opportunity for women-owned enterprises to begin to access green financing uh, by posturing themselves. And, and not just you know, the greenwashing, by, but by uh, deliberately incorporating uh, VSS in, in their businesses. I think um, generally speaking, one of the challenges that has been there is obviously the sentiment that VSS could be exclusionist as opposed to uh, being more inclusion uh, or driving inclusion uh, when it comes to access to international markets, uh, women-owned enterprises, you know, the time poverty for women. The fact that now for them to incorporate sustainability procedures in their businesses, that will take time. Um, there is a cost to it. There is uh, the challenges around uh, capacity development uh, for them. And, and so that has a tendency to appear to be more of an exclusionist uh, measure uh, rather than uh, driving inclusion. And so I think one of the things that is really critical going forward is expand spaces for capacity building for women-owned enterprises, but also all those that play within the ecosystem. We have the public uh, sector players, policy makers, but also critical players here, trade associations, 
uh, the BMOs or what we call the business member organizations build capacity for women enterprises on what really does it mean um, to, to build, uh, even systematically, build uh, uh, sustainability consciousness in the production uh, of their goods and services. But beyond that, uh, providing deliberate engagement um, to, to larger companies, one of the targets or tactics that we have used to facilitate access for women um, enterprises in international trade is to engage uh, larger corporates to incorporate uh, women-owned enterprises within their global value chains. And that is working really well uh, in our markets where we have larger companies providing a certain percentage of their procurement spend for women enterprises. Kenya has led uh, the way around what we call access to government procurement uh, opportunities, providing 30% of all government spend uh, for women and, and youth-led enterprises. And if we can have that as a metric, particularly for larger corporates, that they have a clearly defined target uh, with regard to how much of their spend uh, goes to women-owned enterprises, then we will have um, measurable uh, impact uh, for, for women. But then one more thing, the opportunity to enhance competitiveness. Uh, there's a huge opportunity for women to position themselves to tap from the huge market. Uh, like I said, we have a rising uh, middle class, we have a, 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 a bulging youth population that is very uh, de determined um, or that is very clear about what kind of products they want to, to purchase. We obviously have fallen behind as a continent with regard to taking advantage of, um, of market opportunities, uh, global market opportunities for sustainably produced uh, services. So there's a huge opportunity right there for, for us to, to be able to tap in, into that. Um, I, I, I think that, that will be my contribution for now um, as, and, and we'll be uh, sharing a little bit more as we move along. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kezi. Um, I, I really appreciate how you debunk the myth of, around VSS, which comes very important to raise for our next speaker as well. Uh, Suhasini Singh, uh, Regional Coordinator uh, for South Asia, uh, Country Manager for India Fairway Foundation. Um, Suhasini, as as the only speaker from a VSS perspective, your expertise with this system proves extremely valuable to us. Um, how does VSS like Fairware uh, contribute to women's economic empowerment? And to be specific in my question, um, what are some of the opportunities and challenges of standard systems uh, that can help to empower women? Over to you, Suhasini. Thank you, Siti. And um, my greetings for International Women's Day to all of us. Um, and this panel is an extremely important contribution to mark the contribution of women um, in the development uh, of the world. While um, my perspective will come largely from uh, my work in the garment sector uh, and garment industry is um, a, a global supply chain industry. It doesn't function in one place and one, um, country, one continent, uh, but it is very complex and interlinked, intermingled, I mean, all of it. And there's a plethora of um, voluntary sustainability standards. We have one, of course, uh, but our uh, member brands uh, also have several uh, of such um, standards. But before I get into that, I'll, uh, let me brief, uh, give a brief about the organization itself. Fairway Foundation is a multi-stakeholder initiative of clothing brands. So companies, clothing brands become our member um, and thereby also agree to uh, follow the standards that we have um, and while they have their own. So I, it's more complementary or more aligning these standards. Um, although we don't call ourselves so much as a standard organization, but we do have a code of conduct um, and each of these, uh, I mean, several other companies call these standards 
by different names. And code of conduct is also another usually used uh, a name for voluntary standards. So I am my lookout for voluntary standards is a bit uh, more uh, from a critical um, angle. Uh, while the voluntary standards do contribute towards um, women economic empowerment, but I think it's also um, a lot of it is also towards benefiting the company themselves. Um, and we should understand these voluntary standards often are not are coming from the companies, like from the buyer, and not from the ones who are producing the product. Um, we heard from uh, Mr. Ambassador about the banana industry. Uh, so the uh, the standards are not coming from the farmers themselves, but from uh, an external organization who is, in some way or the other, uh, benefiting from the produce and also, I mean, they have the criteria of um, complying with the standards or not, uh, the voluntary sustainability standards. Now, we should also understand that the compliance of these standards comes with a cost. Any compliance comes with a cost, and the cost has to be borne by the producers. Or in, in the agriculture sector, if I may just extend the uh, theory, um, it, will, it has to be borne by the farmers uh, themselves. And again, going to down to the worker, it will be the women who is uh, bearing the cost of the compliance. It, from the government sector perspective, it, the, it's the factories, the uh, garment factories who bear the cost of the compliance. So they have to uh, have a proper fire exit or pay minimum wages to workers and, and several other things that is required by the law. But since the uh, one that is required by the law is non-negotiable and that the factories have to do it. But where the voluntary standards come into play, they find, the producers find ways to cut corners uh, in terms of just passing the test so to say, in order to have the business or continue this business relationship with the, uh, with the buyer. While I would agree with the initial premise that VSS contrib contributes towards uh, uh, women economic empowerment, I would again say that it comes with, it, with a cost and all voluntary standards are not holistic, none of it is. And it also, the voluntary standards come, come with its own limitations. And Again, um, as uh, Dr. Amrita had pointed out, that it's not un uh, enforceable. Who is to monitor these, uh, the, uh, the implementation of these uh, sustainability standards? To what extent it has been compliant? If there is, if there is not compliance, who is going to take the action? The end result, the, the harsh reality is that if, they, if the producers are non-compliant, then there will be no business relationship between the buyer and the uh, producer. So, Towards the end, if you see the um, repercussion of non-compliance of a VSS, uh, then it's the worker who is paying the cost because of lack of business would also mean there's no employment uh, going further. However, VSS has its, uh, as I said, has had its limited uh, contribution. Um, and as for the garment uh, industry, I would say that it has definitely made um, the physical uh, workplace uh, quite safe. They're well lit uh, factories, um, and um, you know workstations are uh, hygiene and uh, canteens are good. But when you see the nuances of labor uh, labor entitlements or rights, then then it gets starts to get dirty. And if they whether the sexual harassment still persists, uh, still continues in the uh, workplace or the standards the VSS have had a, um, um, an impact on curbing the sexual harassment, you would not get a clear answer. In fact, it, it would say it, it, it's only the fact that it's, um, it's still being continued, but it's just not being reported. So there are, and this is also the reason why in international instruments, the voluntary instruments like OECD guidelines or um, the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, or similarly, I mean, I'm based in India, the uh, National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights. So all these voluntary instruments have not met with great success. And this is also the reason why most many European countries have gone ahead and passed some mandatory laws on due diligence of human rights in the supply chain. And also the recent development, just like two, two weeks back, um, there was a move at the European Parliament to have mandatory human rights due diligence in the supply chain. So these are also, steps uh, taken, I think it's in the right direction that unless it is made mandatory, the businesses would not um, follow the standards to the T, it will only follow to the extent that it is 
benefiting them. And just to give you an example of a women empowerment project done by a brand, um, and I would not name a brand, it's also not a Fairway member brand, but nevertheless, in the name of women empowerment of worker in the garment industry, what the, the training is about uh, menstrual hygiene and uh, what they should be eating and that kind of stuff, while these are important, of course, but it doesn't empower them as a labor to demand their rights at the workplace. And the trainers had, while the brand had clearly told the trainers to not say anything about unionization, for example, or being collect or collectivizing and then ask for your dues with the employer. So such training or such empowering topics are not dealt with. So you also see the see how the voluntary standards or such projects in the name of uh, you know, going or doing their sustainability, uh, taking the sustainability step, what the effort of greenwashing their own image instead of, you know, actually benefiting the worker. I mean, what happens in the name of gender, uh, gender empowerment? Um, this, these are my uh, initial thoughts. It has a great potential, undoubtedly, but it's not, since it is not enforceable, people see it more as a measure to benefit themselves. Brands, especially the companies, especially uh, producers try to cut corners when it, because it comes with a cost. It's not mandatory. Uh, it's only a nice thing to do and um, a nice thing to do. I mean, not everyone is in a position to do something nice. They're also very basic uh, need to run a business and be profitable and stuff like that. I'll stop with that intervention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suha Sini. Um, very important critical points that you have raised um, from the ground as well. And it's very, it's indeed very valuable um, for us in our research work. So um, we will be coming soon to the Q&A session where we take this time to gather your questions. Um, allow me to quickly divert back to, to, to Mercedes. Uh, in just one minute, what do you think are some of the key points mentioned by our expert speakers? Do you think we should explore deeper uh, for, for our work in UNFSS? I know one minute is not a lot of time, so maybe you might miss out some things, but uh, some things that, that really capture your attention um, that would be very helpful for our work as well. Well, I will refer to Suhasini comments because they are very important. We don't want DSS to be an instrument for exclusion. We want them to be an instrument for inclusion. So it's very important that we have that in mind because otherwise we can have very nice free trade agreements with things about DSS. And at the end, the only beneficiaries could be large firms and not the real people that we want to benefit here. I hope that helps. <laughs> Excellent point. Thank you very much, Mercedes. Um, so we're trying to uh, get the questions from the floor. Um, while we get to that, actually, we do have um, some questions as well for our speakers based on um, some of the things you have raised. Um, the first question um, I would like to raise is for Ambassador Blackman. Um, you mentioned some examples and the challenges uh, that the countries in seeds um, to, in order to advance a, a gender, a trade, gen, uh, a trade gender agenda through uh, the use of DSS, what would you see the role of UN organizations in this case uh, in order to support uh, developing countries in this process? Yeah, thank you. Now, I think you, you've really placed the, the question in the right place and the right locator. Um, the UN, given that it's a multilateral institution, uh, comprising of many moving parts, but working, of course, in a common purpose, really serves as the best place, um, one, to have, and two, how do we do that? Um, the member governments. The government, the, the organization is made up of governments, and therefore governments then have has a greater role in, one, ensuring that there is a, a focus on these and in the implementation, but two, then you have to take that and then streamline that in terms of all of the work programs, all of the agendas, whether it be trade, whether it be health, whether it be um, debt financing, so that there is a commonality of purpose. Uh, and once you can then have that clear, well-defined strategy and structure, it makes it a lot easier because you, you don't want to just have one sector. And I think one of the panelists, I'm not sure if it was uh, Dr. Arose who mentioned that, um, but she is right in that regard. 
Uh, governments have to play a greater role, but not just in capitals, but through the multilateral system itself where they are members. So I think there's a huge opportunity for us to do so. Um, but I'd also go further that even using the principle of standards, if we can have some sort of indicator and measurement that allows for us to uh, measure the progress in this regard, it holds everyone accountable and it allows for us to then see clearly what gaps um, exist and what timelines we can have to bring these gaps closer um, to zero, because that's going to be important. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Blackman. Yes, indeed, uh, measuring gaps is the, the best way to, uh, sorry, to measuring the progress is the best way to uh, address any gaps um, uh, in this regard. Um, so the, I'm gonna raise the second question. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna raise the question to the second speaker for Amrita. Um, what do you think, because I think you mentioned some uh, in engagement with stakeholder and especially engaging the private uh, companies as well. What do you think is needed for a more impactful uh, stakeholder engagement where gender is concerned? Thank you for the question. I'll probably circle back to what Ambassador Blackman said. Um, it is absolutely important to create evidence of what we are talking about, right? So we clearly have gaps. But what are these gaps and where do these gaps lie? We can only try to highlight them with gender disaggregated data. So we need data which is specific to industry, which is specific to gender, and which is specific to economic sectors and countries to be, to be able to show to the policymakers and decision makers that look, there's clearly a problem here. And therefore, it is important to encourage the industries. I guess free trade agreements can play two different roles here. Um, there are few free trade agreements which have incorporated CSR provisions and they have incorporated mandatory binding uh, obligatory commitments on their private stakeholders. And then there are the kinds that have um, encouraged their private stakeholders to incorporate CSR provisions in their code of conduct. However, it is important to bear in mind that there are no magic bullets. These CSR or VSS provisions are no magic bullets. They have their own constraints. As Sohasni pointed out, uh, they can impose more cost on uh, the producers and ultimately the consumers. Um, and they leave a large sector of economy outside, which is the gray sector, which is the informal economy. So they need to be considered in light of their constraints. Thank you very much, uh, Amrita. That was very enlightening, of course. Um, I'm going to go straight to uh, the question we have for KZ now. Um, you mentioned uh, about enhancing earnings, for example. You mentioned green finance, for example. Um, indeed, financial is another important detail to help empower women. Would you have any knowledge on the ground about any institutions that women can, can, can tap on for financial or credit assistance? Or if not, how do you think institutions like this can benefit by moving towards this direction? Great, thank you. Thank you, Siti. Of course, um, we, we have to look at what the end goal is. Um, you know, for, for financial institutions, but also for women-owned enterprises. We look at generally women economic empowerment. What does that mean? The ability for those women to succeed, to advance economically, it means that they have to acquire the right skills, they have to acquire the right resources to enable them to compete in markets and gain equal access uh, to economic empowerment. When there is an, a gap in financing, then uh, women's economic empowerment cannot be attained. So access to markets has to go at the same pace with access to training and access to information and then access to financing. One advancing faster than the other doesn't necessarily help women enterprises. It has to be a three in one uh, solution. And we've seen many institutions adopting that model. So they will provide the green financing, but they know that a lot of women need capacity building for them to get to that place where they would even qualify for that financing. So they begin to build uh, capacity build, uh, building programs for their customers to get them to that place where they have you know, a sustainability plans within the business. Then they have a product that can actually get to market. And then now they can absorb the financing 
and, and, and be able, and, and then it's not financing that will kill their businesses because we've also seen a kind of financing that does not advance, but actually kills uh, the businesses. So yes, we do have a leading, one of the leading banks in Kenya, for example, uh, KCB announcing a certain uh, uh, proportion of their lending will be green financing, but they are coupling that with uh, capacity building and also market exposure uh, trips. Uh, to allow uh, women on the enterprise space uh, thrive in a sustainable manner. Thank you very much, Casey. It's uh, it's nice that you mentioned this bank in Kenya. I think for us as well, we're, we will have to look into that as one of our um, ways to um, attend our research as well. Um, that was very helpful. Thank you very much, Casey. Um, you also mentioned that it's not just finance, but also capacity building, which is actually um, very important. And, and I would like to bring this question along uh, for, for Suhasini. You both, I mean, because you raised this uh, critical point about upskilling women. And we do know that the government industry is one sector that employs mostly women, 80% of them. So, um, it, but you know, as we have seen in, in our study, women generally have multiple roles, and one of which is that they are also caretaker of the household, and they may most of the time be challenged with their mobility. Um, so, so what? How can standards um, like Fairway, for example, help women overcome this? Thank you, Siti. Um, I think the core of the issue is that businesses and the standards do not focus on family oriented policy and and this is and when we have family oriented or family friendly not oriented family friendly uh, policies this gives a good push for women to pursue the work that they are doing to advance in the career that they want to uh, upskilling and moving up in the ladder um, so as standards if we also focus and we cannot I mean, for obvious reasons, we cannot ignore the other responsibility that women have, the reproductive responsibility. And uh, so it is. it becomes even more important to have, and not just for women-oriented industries, it's definitely uh, crucial for such industries, but also for other industries to have a family-friendly policy, to have a functional crash in the factory, or, or, or a grievance mechanism, a functioning grievance mechanism. Uh, for example, if they have issues, they can raise um, a grievance which is addressed and not, there should not be repercussions for raising a grievance. So these, I, I think a family friendly policy with a target for women to give every opportunity. There was one of the three pillars of V was opportunity. And with the first that was mentioned, opportunity for them to choose to in the area in which they want to upskill, they want to pursue a career, give, give that opportunity for them to be absorbed if they're upskilled. They, they should also be absorbed by the industry and not just have it for namesake and after two months they're again down to, I mean, talking about garment industry, if they are trained to be a supervisor and then after two months of working as a supervisor, they are again downgraded to, uh, to be a worker because she was according to the management, she was not performing well. So these things, I mean, uh, hand-holding, uh, upskilling, uh, great support from the team, family-friendly family friendly policies uh, and opportunity, these, I would say, are the key things to uh, for women to uh, be in a career, career industry and pursue it while taking care of the family. I was on mute. Thank you very much, Sula Sini. That was a very interesting point of family friendly policy. I think we also have to look into that as well. Um, so I think some of the key things that we've uh, gathered today are things like uh, data gaps, uh, things like financial, um, fa family friendly policies as well. And thanks for all these uh, important points. Um, we've seen many of your questions being raised in the chat, and I think uh, my colleague Nima has been diligently uh, responding to you via chat as well uh, in the interest of time. Um, actually, yes. Okay, thanks, Noelia. I was about to come to you, but um, in the interest of time, um, uh, I just like to 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 uh, just ask this one question to all uh, the speakers uh, because we're we're um, past the time already. 
Um, I just have one last question for all the speakers um, in order to conclude this session. And it's very important for us as well, especially. Um, so allow me to just raise this one question, which is the, um, for all speakers, as I mentioned, in less than you know a minute, or I'm gonna be um, nice, uh, maybe one minute. Um, tell us how in the near future, do you think this dialogue that we just have can be weaved into the work that you do as a policymaker, as a standard setter, as a researcher, um, as an industry player, your, your own roles? Um, I'm going to hand over firstly, of course, to Ambassador Blackman as a policymaker. Thank you very much. Simply put, uh, one of the things I'm going to do is to one, um, look at the outcome of today's dialogue, look at the key tenants, and then see which platforms I have um, and to raise awareness. But additionally, sharing the information with colleagues um, and policymakers is going to be important. So I would also like to see, if possible, if we can have each person's dialogue uh, cut into the key bits that they've highlighted, um, we can share it in terms of not just the social media, but also sending it via correspondence. And then uh, internally, in terms of here in Geneva, certainly uh, I think it would be good even for missions to have discussions further on this so that then it goes back to that streamlining that I was talking about um, and we move it therefore from dialogue to action. Excellent, dialogue to action, we like that. <laughs> okay, so next I'm gonna hand over to uh, Dr. Uh, Amrita Bahri, over to you. Thank you. Um, as an academic, I think uh, the key role uh, we uh, discharge and we owe is research and publication to inform, aware, and build capacity. Uh, capacity building is an important point mentioned in the discussion today. And ultimately, engage in dialogue with the policymakers and international organizations to strengthen on the acts of uh, policy information, shaping of the future trade agreements, negotiation, and dissemination of this information. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Amrita. Next, I'm going to hand over to Kezi. Over to you. Thank you, Siti. I think, firstly, in my role as an entrepreneur, um, I've been successful to build businesses that have uh, scooped a lot of awards because of the sustainability um, uh, methodology, uh, the sustainability programs that we've built in the business. And my role there will be as you know, to mentor and coach other women that I work with, you know, share our own experiences and, and help build, raise others. But also as a trade consultant who is working with different organizations, perhaps to continue shining the light, uh, building linkages, I will be even reaching out to you guys, figuring out how can we build uh, our capacity building programs with the VSS models, you might make use of the research uh, that you have. And I think beyond that, I sit in a lot of um, the boards for trade associations. Um, and my role there will continue to, continue to equip the leadership of BMOs, um, the leadership of trade associations to uh, raise many more women um, to, to leverage on, on sustainability standards. Excellent. Thank you very much, Casey. I think um, we heard that UNFSS will be very happy to help where um, we can as well. Thanks for raising that. And last but not least, um, I'm going to also let Suhasini um, share what would be your future um, uh, activity coming out from this event. Yeah, um, since our direct relation is with the business, as I said, they become a, they are our members. Our direct engagement uh, will be or is rather to get commitment from the business to work on the sustainability standards that they have in letter and in spirit. Uh, and we are there as an organization to monitor what they're doing um, uh, as per their, uh, their standards or following our standards. Um, but as I said also in, when, in my first intervention that voluntary standards, sustainability standards have their limitations. And that is why as an organization we are working uh, or pushing towards a mandatory human rights due diligence for the global supply chain uh, in, at European level and in the countries. We are currently working in Indonesia to have a free trade agreement, uh, Europe-Indonesia Europe, uh, free trade agreement. Uh, the talks are on in terms of what to include and what not. And I'm sure gender, not I'm sure, I know that gender is a, a big part of it. Similarly with Vietnam, also we are trying to influence the free trade agreement with Europe and Vietnam. 
In India, we are uh, working on the laws, the labor laws, which have recently been reformed to make it more robust for, um, for the labor. And again, with the industry being more women oriented, women are going to be uh, benefiting from a progressive and very strong laws. Yeah. Thank you very much. Suhasini, these are all, thank you to all the speakers. Once again, I think uh, we've, we've captured a lot of interesting points that we need to weave into our work as well. Thanks to um, all your, your inputs. We really appreciate this and we're very happy to have this even with you. So with that, we're um, almost 10 minutes past <laughs> the time. So um, allow me to officially conclude uh, this webinar. And thank you everyone for joining in with us today. Have a nice day and happy International Women's Day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.